equitable climate resilient built environments. The Christofferson Center is one of the founding partners of CROWD, which stands for Circularity, Reuse, Zero Waste Development, and we're an organizer of CROWD Conversations. I'm pleased to welcome tonight's presenter, Mae Boley of Repurpose Savannah, a women plus led nonprofit based in Savannah, Georgia, that uses deconstruction techniques to provide material preservation and treat dying structures with dignity. Susan Holland of Historic Ithaca, a crowdfunding partner, will moderate tonight's session. And just before we start, a couple of housekeeping details. Um, we value your time, especially on a Monday night. So we'll keep this conversation to an hour, including the Q&A. So please type your questions in the chat as we go along and we'll get to those at the end. And please keep yourselves muted so everybody can hear the presentation. We are recording the session and we'll share that out to everybody who's registered for tonight's event. Our next crowd conversation will be on May 1st with Cornell University master's students who actively participate in crowd. And a couple of them will be presenting their final projects for their degree that involve analysis and recommendations for both deconstruction policy and reuse center establishment. And this is really the culmination of two years of their close work with, with crowd and the work that we've been doing. And you can register for that online at crowd.org, crowd with a zero for zero waste development. So, um, whoops, here we go. Crowd is a network of partners who came together in 2020 to work toward a more sustainable built environment in New York State. We are planners, architects, preservationists, municipal staff, salvage and reuse professionals, environmentalists, university faculty and students, and our numbers are growing. We're working to create a circular construction economy in New York State that brings environmental, economic, and social benefit to all of our communities. Among our core efforts, we support and advocate for the deconstruction and building material reuse rather than demolition of buildings and infrastructure and the creation of vast amounts of landfill waste. We work on local and state policies and practices, research and analysis, education and community engagement, and equitable workforce development. So you can get more information about us at our website, crowd.org. You can learn about our partners and their work. You can register for crowd events like this one. You can sign up for our mailing list, download resource guides, reach out for more information. So um, I'd now like to introduce our moderator for the evening, my colleague, Susan Holland, who is the executive director at Historic Ithaca. She leads the team to provide education and advocacy for Tompkins County community and its built environment. Significant Elements is Historic Ithaca's architectural salvage store. It's also the site of Work Preserve, a job training program for young adults with barriers to employment. Susan believes that sustainability and preservation are interconnected, and to that end, Historic Ithaca was a founding partner of Crowd. Deconstruction is one of many tools in the preservation toolkit, and like adaptive reuse and restoration, deconstruction is a waste diversion tool and a climate action strategy. Susan also serves on the Electrify Ithaca Community Advisory Board, the Career Pathways Project, and the Block Power Education Partners for the City of Ithaca, and the plan to decarbonize all of its 6,000 existing buildings. She's also on the Erie Canal Way Heritage Area Commission, and she's the Tompkins, as well as the Tompkins County Historical Commission. After graduating from Cornell with a degree in communication, she worked in creative arts management in New York City, and then held positions in community development and preservation for the last 30 years. Previous to her position in, at Historic Ithaca, she was the director of Historic Albany Foundation, where she observed firsthand the waste of hundreds of demolitions. And so Susan, thank you for moderating tonight's evening with May and over to you. Thank you, Gretchen. I should have told you to edit the bio a little bit. I just, <laughs> one of those days. Um, I wanted to read a land acknowledgement first. Uh, we open up all of our programming, um, which is super important. So, uh, Skeno to everyone. And Ithaca is on the traditional homelands of the Gaiacono, the Cuyahoga Nation. The Gaiacono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy predates precedes the establishment of Ithaca, New York, uh, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gaikona dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gaikona people, past and present, to these lands and water. Thank you. Um, 
I would now like to just uh, introduce May, get her slides up. Um, and so May Boley, I'm really excited to introduce her and work with her. Uh, she moved to Savannah in 2015. Welcome to New York State. And well, actually we're nationwide tonight, so it's good. Um, out of a desire to learn more about the charming and mysterious city, uh, she started taking classes in historic preservation and restoration at S Savannah Technical College. When she em encountered emergent structures, the parent organization of Repurpose Savannah in 2018, she fell in love. Um, she was an avid volunteer for six months, six months, and then hired on as an assistant executive director. In 2019, May took over as executive director. May hold the Masters of Art in Art Education from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, along with a Bachelor of Art in Graphic Design and a Bachelor of Art in Classical Archaeology from the Florida, from Florida State University. Her professional background includes a creative director for a manufacturing firm, a marketing manager for an urban farm, and a principal in her own marketing consultancy uh, firm for creative startups, Foley Creative. She harbors a fierce passion for longleaf pine and will often be caught gushing over it. May, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, for your presentation, and we also have a guest with her, uh, Hannah Miller, and at the end, um, we'll take your questions and uh, moderate those questions for May and for Hannah. Thank you, May. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Gretchen. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I've been admiring crowds since y'all started um, working together, and it's just such a such a wonderful thing to watch how deconstruction is growing in the marketplace and, and it's due to all the hard work of everybody in organizations like yours. So thank you very much for having me um, and I'm glad to be here and thanks to everyone who's in the audience. It looks like we've got a pretty good crowd. Uh, okay, so my name's May. I'm the executive director of Repurpose Savannah. Uh, we work in Savannah, Georgia, which is a very charming historic city. Uh, and even here, many, many buildings end up, uh, historic buildings end up going to the landfill. So we like to wade in and do what we can to keep them out. So because, uh, well, let me start with our mission. Our mission, quite simply, is to use the tools of deconstruction and reuse to help establish a more sustainable future. And this is a lot of words, but I always say we have a three-leaf clover. One leaf is uh, environmentalism, looking to create or to support and grow a climate conscious alternative to demolition. The second leaf on our clover is historic preservation, trying to bring, trying to not only update preservation ideals in, in, in a more equitable way, but also uh, bring those to bear on the structural removal uh, practice. Preservation ideals uh, should definitely be uh, in place when we're when we're taking buildings away from the landscape. And the third, but the one I'm going to spend the most time talking about today, is we train women plus, and that is an inclusive term. Uh, women, you know, are probably the largest uh, demographic uh, that falls under our umbrella. Uh, but we also work with many many non-binary people, trans folks, and we just say other underrepresented people because construction and demolition uh, has been largely male dominated. And there's a very uh, specific type of person that's traditionally held this kind of job. So we really look to create more inclusivity, sort of perforate that barrier and help all kinds of outsiders uh, find access to, to careers in construction and demolition. Um, so this group is really familiar with what deconstruction is. And if we were in a classroom setting, I would be asking you this question, what's deconstruction? And I'd have you shout out your answers. Um, but since we can't do that, I'm just going to fly through this part of the presentation so we can get to the bit uh, that's really unique to repurpose Savannah. So deconstruction is unbuilding buildings. It's uh, taking them apart in the opposite order they were built, of course. Um, I do like to point out that there are multiple types of deconstruction, non-structural, which everyone is familiar with, even outside the decon world, this is architectural salvage. They're structurally compromising decon, and this is what I refer to as poaching, uh, people who are compromising buildings in order to gain salvage, whether or not they have permission, uh, which often precipitates the loss of historic fabric, um, is not sanctioned and is often done illegally. Uh, this is something we'd like to see come to, a, come to an end. Uh, and this can happen if and when deconstruction becomes much more normalized in the in the CND world. And then of course, what my company specializes in, which is full service structural removal. That's top to bottom. We like to say uh, ridge beam to sill and including your, your foundation and piers, of course. So um, why is this important? Y'all know why. Uh, I speak to a lot of preservation groups. So it is important for me to spend time explaining why, explaining specifically that 
decon is an alternative to demolition. It's not an alternative to preservation. Uh, our mission is to really center ideals of preservation around concepts of research and documentation uh, to center narratives and histories, especially of marginalized communities where the bulk of deconstruction happens. So in order to do that, we must accept the fact of structural loss. Uh, people in the decon world totally get this, but people in the preservation world struggle with this concept. Not every building can live forever unfortunately. And so this is what we see he, even here in historic Savannah. This is Montgomery Street. Uh, this is actually really close to the downtown core right here in Savannah. Um, and so because they don't live forever, uh, we have to come up with solutions to, to take care of them. Uh, historic preservation standards also state that the highest and best material to repair your historic building is in-kind, in-kind materials. Folks often understand this to mean materials that look similar, to what you've got or that are the right shape and size, not totally changing the appearance. But I would also add to that that the most in-kind materials are materials that are contemporary in age. It came from the same time. It was made of the same species of tree. It was in the same bioregion for its entire life. That, it couldn't get more in-kind than that. And there's no better place to source these materials than in historic buildings. My passion in all of this is really in the trees. I like to point out that a lot of timber in historic buildings is coming from endangered or extinct species. And I also like to acknowledge that when we're talking about this materiality, we're talking about the ancient American, the, the wild American forest. So this isn't necessarily my heritage. Uh, I'm the descendant of European colonizers. This is Native American heritage. Uh, the trees were here long before Europeans were, and we cut them all down to build America. So it's very important that we honor those materials, don't just throw them in the landfill, but then attach all of that awareness and history to these things as they're re-entering the marketplace. Um, on my little heart, pine heart, uh, here in the Southeast, this is longleaf pine country. Of course, Georgia, famous for its longleaf and its turpentine exports, even during colonial times. This is the best stuff in the whole world. You've got Georgia heart pine all the way up the coast. You've got it in Washington state. You've got it on the West coast. Uh, it traveled far and wide. You, you find it in Europe. It traveled far and wide because it was so abundant and so special and spectacular. So this is what I have the pleasure of handling most every day. We all know that construction and demolition generates more than double the total municipal solid waste in the United States. This is why it's so important that we address uh, some circularity in, in the built environment. Uh, and of course, the BBC recently released this study uh, suggesting that CND is responsible for a third of the world's waste. And that's too much. So again, going through all of this because uh, we might have some new folks with us, but those of you who are on the call may or may or who are familiar with deconstruction may or may not know how exactly we got here. Uh, we take demolition for granted. We take it as an understood uh, aspect of the built environment, but this practice is less than 100 years old. If you haven't read Francesca Russello Ammon's book, The Bulldozer, I highly recommend it. The subtitle is Demolition and Clearance of the Post-War Landscape. And in it, she really uh, helped educate me um, about the development of bulldozers and excavators and all this heavy machinery that we associate with demolition. It was developed during World War II to help move troops, tanks, uh, in, in the European theater and to help clear out bombed out cities. Uh, and this was of course all brought home after the war and put to work in the domestic landscape for such projects as urban renewal and uh, the building of the US highways. I got my slides a little out of order here. I love this quote from my dear friend, Alison Arlotta, um, whether motivated by practicality or reverence or both, disassembly and reuse of building materials is a practice as old as building itself. Uh, this is really powerful for preservation communities to come to understand that uh, demol or demolition is, is a newfangled invention. Uh, deconstruction and reuse is, is historic, traditional, authentic, uh, and legit practice for the handling of historic buildings at the end of their life cycle, and honestly, truly all buildings. Um, so of course, how can we do better? My, my nonprofit in specific emphasizes research and documentation. Uh, we, we, of course, would like to see less of this and more of this. Uh, this is how we can honor these materials. And here's how we can also uh, maybe spread the love. We, we, we attach all of our preservation ideals to buildings as objects. And it's my personal mission to help people understand that the materials and the material parts of these buildings also deserve just as much precious care, even if the building can't stay in place. But ultimately, uh, we're also trying to encourage people to realize that removal of a building from the landscape is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for education. 
deconstruction is a wonderful time to bring students into a to a historic building and to teach in ways that you just can't teach in a restoration project. There are differences uh, and there's a moment when you can see the inside of these buildings that is a really important and a wonderful thing to share with students. Uh, research and documentation ought to be attached to structural removal, especially of historic buildings. And I'm very pleased to say here in Savannah, we've made a little progress policy-wise. And now in order to get a demo permit, for a historic building, you must document the building and submit that to the archives or your permit will not be granted. So that's progress, we're moving in the right direction. Um, we're also 3D scanning our buildings. So here's a scan of one of our buildings, sort of like in its moment that we that we got it under contract. And then we've also gotten into the practice of, of scanning them a second time when we stripped out the interior so that all of the historic framing can go into a growing archive for students of, of historic buildings to, to understand and to sort of see behind the finish and, and understand how these things were built and how building technology changed over time. Now to the point. Construction and demolition is a $7.4 billion industry. 10% of those jobs are held by women. And it's even smaller of a percentage on the job site. One in a hundred site workers are women. Uh, and this probably is only capturing women. If we were to look at people who identify as non-binary or trans, I, I don't even know if anybody's even bothered to do a study of such. So we know very marginalized, very small numbers. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about why this is, historic barriers, of course, gender bias. Some of it is intuitive, but some of it bears a little bit of sussing out um, to really understand what's going on. So at Repurpose Savannah, 100% of our crew is, well, female identified or non-binary. So we're very proud to have created a safe space for Women Plus to come and train. Uh, and, and this happened very organically. In the early days, we were not Women Plus only. In the early days, we were co-ed. We, we were just getting started uh, and our nonprofit is about five years old now. We were just getting started and we invited anybody who was interested in getting as dirty as we were going to have to get to, uh, to come and work with us. And I observed some interesting phenomena. Um, first and foremost, it didn't occur to me that it was odd that so many women were applying for jobs. Uh, it wasn't until it was pointed out to me that that was unusual that I started to reflect on why. And I know now that it was because I was visible doing the work. When we began, we created, of course, marketing media campaigns, social media to try to drum up interest, to try to get stakeholders involved and try to get volunteers and, and crew to come out and help us. And, and we were a two person team, one male, one female. And I was visible. I was in a lot of the pictures taking a building apart. And as such, I think a lot of women and women plus felt encouraged to apply uh, and came out. And so we had fairly even split crew in the early days. And I observed a good deal of mm, behaviors that were antithetical to, to equal learning. I like to say that a lot of men and boys, and these are these are generalizations, you know, I'm an exception to this rule. I grew up very empowered to play with power tools. But what I've observed and what I, some of you may identify with is that a lot of boys come up with what's what, what I would call the the birthright of tool use. It means that they were encouraged to interact with tools. It means that they were supported in the pursuit of, of even play, um, interacting with power tools and construction themes. Uh, uh, many women that I know and non-binary people that I know were discouraged from playing with tools. I didn't have that experience. My mom's a super, super bad uh, mom and she built the she built the decks on our house and my dad doesn't know which end of the hammer you're supposed to swing although he's a brilliant man um, and so for me gender norms and and construction and tools were always conflated but uh but i came to realize that that wasn't the case for a lot of people and so many humans were showing up eager to learn and i didn't like observing how their learning was interrupted by people who already had more familiarity than they did. There's a phenomenon that we see. We saw a lot of the dudes on our crew taking tools out of women's hands and trying to do it for them because they weren't as fast or offering to carry things that seemed too heavy. And I would say, how, how is she supposed to get stronger if you always carry things for her? How is she supposed to learn how to use the tool as fast as you if you take it away because she's not fast enough? So that was when we decided that we needed to create a safe space for learning where 
no one had to be anxious about the level of their skill where no one felt intimidated from demonstrating their level of skill and where everyone was welcome on an equal footing to to gain skills and to and to to gain careers in what is a really robust and, and fascinating industry uh, i like to say women can get dirty too <laughs> my crew you just ask them we're filthy <laughs> <laughs> I love this photo because Katie always has her nice fingernail polish, even when she is covered head to toe in soot. Uh, chimney work is dirty work, y'all. So sometimes we come away looking like this. Uh, it's very sooty in there. Um, here's my crew and myself uh, in front of one of our jobs. Something that we take a lot of pride in is being very visible. We don't hide. We are out there. And it does, it does create an interesting climate. People will pull over on the side of the road. This, this job site in particular was highly visible. It was at a busy intersection and people would pull over just to comment on how odd it was that women were doing this work. So it's not normal. Um, it should be, and it, it can be, and it will be. Uh, but for the meantime, visibility matters. Uh, and so we do a lot to try to invite people into the story of not only the buildings as we're taking them apart, but also the humans that we're helping to in, in view with skills and in confidence, not only the hard skills, but also the soft skills that you need to be successful in construction and demolition. I'm also very interested in training up future leaders of deconstruction. Deconstruction is such a fascinating and emerging industry. It's moving really quickly. Uh, and I like to believe that many of our graduates are gonna go on to leadership roles uh, and help and help grow, not only grow the industry, but also help women and women plus take up space in the industry. Uh, here's my crew in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. When I talk about visibility, I really mean it. We get out there, we're loud, we're proud, um, and we really, we really try to make sure that folks know that there's a place if they're curious and they want to learn that they can come. Uh, I'd like to talk very quickly uh, about our registered apprenticeship program that we're currently working on. This is a Department of Labor, RAP. You may or may not be familiar with such thing, but this is a nationally recognized standard. Uh, it's a curriculum. And if you uh, are providing an RAP, your students will graduate with a certification that's nationally recognized. And this makes our graduates highly employable. They're gonna be able to go anywhere in the country and say, here's my credential and, and know that they would demand journey, journeyman or journey person <laughs> level pay um, and respect uh, and, and careers. So we're doing this in partnership with uh, Savannah Technical College where I got my certification in um, historic preservation. And also we're working closely with Preservation Maryland. They're our sponsor for putting this together. They're really gonna help support us administratively I imagine that there's a lot of folks that are working in deconstruction here, and I don't have to tell you that it's a lot of work to maintain the HR aspect of training people. It's really difficult in my area to hire anybody who knows how to deconstruct because they just don't exist. We're sort of the sole operator in our, in our area. So I had to train everybody. And we figured if we're already training everybody, we, we might as well just do it as gangbuster as we can. Um, so working on developing this is exciting, not only because it's gonna help me increase the quality of the training that I'm able to offer to women and non-binary people here in Savannah, but also once we create this RAP, Registered Apprenticeship Program for Deconstruction, uh, anybody in the country can start an RAP for deconstruction. This will be the first one that's deconstruction specific. So this is really exciting. And this is all driven out of the desire to create high quality level of inclusivity in, in construction and demolition. This is something that's, that's sorely needed. Uh, here's a brief overview of the kind of, of courses that will be taught under this umbrella such obvious and basic things as professional tool use and safety, but then such uh, preservation specific concepts as research and documentation. Uh, uh, anybody with this kind of training under their belt is really, really ready to go for careers in, in construction, demolition, deconstruction, preservation, you name it. Um, it's a skill set that's highly marketable. Uh, and I, I just have to give a shout out to my crew. I, I couldn't be here bragging if I if I didn't have such an amazing cohort. Uh, everybody in our staff were up to 11 at this point. When we started out, it was just me for a little while. Um, and then it was just me and volunteers. And now we have 11 people on staff. Um, and, part, and part of what has allowed this is their willingness to be so brave, so bold, and so visible, and has brought us a lot of support in our community. Um, we're very proud. Of course, safety first, always wear your safety vest and your hard hat when you're on the job. 
of sight. Uh, and we can train such skills, like I said, as super important as being able to safely cut wires, being able to test uh, electrical systems and utilities to be sure um, that buildings are safe to work in. Uh, tool competency is a big deal. This is Yolanda. Yolanda's amazing. Yolanda is also, she's she's a crew member, but she's also a, my marketing manager. So she's just as good with a laptop as she is with that Sawzall. Um, and I have no doubt Yolanda has a super bright future, hopefully with me for a long time. Um, and <laughs> if she ever moves on, uh, really wherever she wants to go. Um, and, and I bring up Yolanda and I love this photo because Yolanda was very intimidated by the Sawzall in the beginning. Um, and unfortunately that's just not gonna fly. <laughs> I repurposed Savannah. So of course, with much support, much training and much positive encouragement, Yolanda now is absolute master of the Sawzall um, and won't miss an opportunity to wield it. Um, we are taking the show on the road. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about that here in a moment when I hand it over to Hannah. Uh, but here's a photograph from San Antonio, Texas, where Katie and myself went to train a cohort of, of um, contractors uh, in San Antonio, Texas, where, you know, they famously just passed the most incredible uh, policy, uh, landmark policy. And we were so proud to come and train these experienced contractors. Everybody here already knew what they were doing. They just didn't know how to do it backward. So we taught them how to do that safely. We were very proud. Uh, this group, because it was existing contractors in Texas, was, was male dominated. But we did have a couple of awesome ladies join the crew. Uh, and they were awesome. Of course, they're always awesome. Um, like I said, women can get just as sturdy. Um, and gets just as much fulfillment uh, and delight and passion out of this career as men. Um, and then recently, actually currently, Katie is still up in Atlanta, uh, our second training, uh, training a cohort of inexperienced humans in deconstruction up in the Atlanta area. And this cohort was about half and half because a prior experience was not required for this training. Uh, and because in the marketing materials, they wisely used our imagery, which included a lot of women plus on the job site. And as such, there was a high number of women applicants. And so this cohort was split about 50-50. And that made me really excited because I'm excited to see in the Atlanta area, a proliferation of deconstruction companies and some of which hopefully are led uh, by, by some of our awesome women trainees. Uh, so of course, ultimately, uh, and we're running out of time, I wanna say uh, the ultimate goal, of course, is to replace this horror of horrors with this and with this, here are some lovely students uh, who came out to the job site in Texas to learn about uh, material handling. And with this, this is Kelly here at my lumber yard here in Savannah, stacking very large stacks of reclaimed building materials. Uh, Kelly never driven a forklift before, now she's trained and certified uh, and many of my staff are working toward that as well. Um, and so, uh, I look forward to answering any questions, but before that happens, I would like to thank you for this time, and I would like to go ahead and hand it over to Hannah Miller to talk about a continuation of some of our training. Thank you, May. I'm going to share a photo real quick, hopefully. Maybe I'm not going to share a photo real quick. Hold on. <laughs> All right. We're can not. You, oh, gonna... Hannah. Hannah, can you try again? I just, I just, uh, I'm a host too. So I just, uh, see, can it be done? Let's see. Multiple share. Can you see it? No. Do you want right. to send it to me, Hannah, and I'll try to do it while you talk? Yes, I can do that. One second. Should have let you before. <laughs> That's okay. It's more fun when there's technical difficulties. Yeah. It's like an intermission. Hope you all are ready for this photo. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good, I swear. All right, May, I think I just sent it to you, but I'm going to start talking anyway. All right, well, thank you everyone for your patience. So my name is Hannah. I am the vice president of the Schenectady County Historical Society, 
And um, for those of you who don't know, the Schenectady County Historical Society maintains three historic sites within Schenectady, two in the Stockade District and one in Rotterdam Junction, which is the Maybe Farm Historic Site. And about two years ago, we acquired the property next to the Maybe Farm Historic Site, which is the really exciting picture that we'll hopefully get one of these days. Um, and nobody was really sure what to do with it. Um, I am the only person on the board, thank you, May, uh, with a preservation background. So before I joined the board, there was a lot of talk of trying to interpret the site, um, make it into a, another historic site for people to visit, make it into a museum, make it into storage space. But after several engineering reports, we realized that that really just wasn't feasible. This um, building is, is not meant to stay up. So about a year ago, I reached out to May after I saw her doing uh, a similar talk to what she just did. And um, I was hoping that she could just give me some advice on how I could figure out how to deconstruct this building. And she did, and then she said, maybe I could do it. And um, we've been talking ever since. So I'm here uh, to tell you all about this really exciting opportunity happening in July in Schenectady. We are going to be hosting another training um, and we are welcoming people to sign up for the training. If you um, want to get involved with the uh, hands-on deconstruction, be trained by May herself. It's going to be um, available to you. Again, that's July 9th to through 22nd. And there's also going to be opportunities for people who don't maybe want to get as messy um, and don't want to get so involved to come watch come help sort the materials, get involved maybe with some of the historic documentation, um, just see what Bay is gonna do. And um, it's really exciting. So if you stay, um, or if you go on to schenectadyhistorical.org, we're gonna have um, sign up options available really soon. So stay tuned for that. Uh, May, did you wanna add anything to that? I just wanted to add that it's going to be super fun and I'm excited to be in upstate New York in July. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a treat. And I am really excited about showing this building some love since it's, uh, you know, sadly, it can't be reused. So uh, that doesn't mean it's, it's, it has to be neglected. That means we can still celebrate uh, its wonderful history and all of its material parts. It's going to be great to share that with everybody. And lots of women should come <laughs> and help us take this building down. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So I suppose with that, I'd be very glad to open the floor up to questions. If anyone has any questions they'd like to ask. I was just coming on May to see what we have. I have some comments in the chat. Um, so um, let's see. Um, I uh, we have a question from uh, Gretchen. What is the timing of the registered apprenticeship program and that anyone else could also start one? And how would that work? Um, and if you could just give us some more details about uh, the registered apprenticeship program. And yes. just say thanks to you both, by the way, for a terrific presentation. So thank you. Sure, you bet. Yeah, the RAP is really exciting. I wish I could give you a super clear timeline. Unfortunately, we're working with the Department of Labor. And that has meant that this has taken several years to even get to the point that we're at right now. And I'll tell you this, we started in the beginning just looking at modifying an existing RAP. This is really common. So say you want to create one that's, speci that's specialized and, and maybe it's close enough, I think it's 20% or less that you need to change, uh, you can just modify an existing one. And so we spent you know several months kicking that idea around because it's a much shorter arc. At the end of the day, we couldn't make it fit. There was too much difference between, the closest we could find was a trim carpenter. Uh, and the, the training for a trim carpenter, it just wasn't adequate. We couldn't modify it enough to really capture the breadth of deconstruction. So we decided to do the much longer, much harder process of creating a new RAP. Uh, and so we are, I like to believe in the final stretch of this, and this should, be available this calendar year, although I'm knocking on wood as I'm saying it because I don't want to jinx it. Other than that, I, I can't get more specific. But yes, once it exists, anyone can use this curriculum to create a, an RAP and deconstruction in their area. And it won't, of course, be specific to whether or not you're training women plus, of course, you can train anybody under an RAP. Right. 
Right. Great. That's great. Thank you for that. And thanks for doing that as well. Um, yeah. Also, uh, another question. Um, are there other ways Savannah is incentivizing deconstruction over demol demolition, um, including requiring the historic documentation of the building in order to get demo permit um, that often obviously leads, uh, is left to the preservationist to advocate for that. So um, is there an incentive for that? And how are, how is that working? Yes. So the first, the first bit of, of, of real policy that we're seeing around this was, it was a, an executive order from the mayor saying, if you're going to try to pull a permit for a historic building, regardless of whether it's in a historic district, that is important. Obviously, Savannah has a great number of very well celebrated and well protected historic districts. That does not necessarily protect every building, even still. We deconstructed last year uh, a building from 1830s right in the core of downtown. So even there, we were able to snipe that one on a one-off basis. So it, we didn't have comprehensive policy. We don't have comprehensive policy like they do in San Antonio yet. Uh, the Savannah Decom Policy Coalition, which of course I work with I'm on, and I'm a founding member of, um, is working toward comprehensive policy. But we also understand that our goal here in Georgia is to build the infrastructure and then follow it up with the policy that requires people to make use of that infrastructure. Great, yeah. great, great. Um, another, uh, another question, what happens to all the materials um, that do result from the repurposed Savannah's uh, deconstruction? Where did they go? What do they, how do they end up? Uh -huh. Oh gosh, the materials are so beautiful. Um, and I, I'm sitting here at our lumber yard right now. I'm in my office at our lumber yard. We have a property in East Savannah at the end of Gwinnett Street. Uh, it's a beautiful property. We're very lucky to be here. Um, we call it the 100 Acre Marsh. So it is 100 acres of property right on the marsh front. Most of it is marsh grasses, and bulrushes, and, gotcha. and mud. Um, but the part that's dry land is where our lumber yard sits. We have a number of large structures that are full of historic building materials. Every single piece is hand labeled so you know exactly which house it came from. Every single history that we've done, all the research, all the 3D scans, all the photographs and documentation, they live on a, a digital archive. So when customers come out here to purchase these goods, and um, we ring them up and they get a receipt in their email, each one of those items has a link straight to our website with the history of the material that they bought. Also, our salespeople are the same as our deconstruction people. So they're very excited to talk about the buildings. They're, they took them apart. We, we have a great deal of pride and connection to our projects by the time they're available for sale. Uh, so our crew is always educating people about the significance and meaning behind them. But yes, come to Savannah and visit our lumber yard and you can see it all yourself. That's, the, that's, the, that's one of the most compelling reasons. I, I, for me, going to Savannah, I can't wait. And now I'm like, oh, I really, now I really need to go. Um, well, Build Reuse yeah. will be here in February. The Build Reuse Conference next year will be here oh, in Savannah. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll be there. So come on down. <laughs> All right. Um, so here's another one that is uh, very, very closely related to what you just said. Um, are there best practices for the best practices for increasing demand for deconstructed materials? Um, yes. Okay. I mean, I, I, was there more you wanted to add to the question before? No, I, I was just going to say, how does that, how does the marketplace look for you? And, um, you know, I guess not even a sales figure, but more like what does the market look like in, uh, in Savannah and your surrounding areas there? Well, I'll tell you, there wasn't one when we got started. And I say this all the time, taking a building apart isn't rocket science. The harder part of deconstruction is building the market to support it. We are already capable of diverting more than we're capable of selling. Mm -hmm. We've had to slow down on deconstruction. We were just flying. We, we were very successful in creating demand for deconstruction services. Creating the demand for the materials is harder. Uh, we're doing great. And I got to give a shout out to Kelly Lowe, who's my director of salvage. Um, and it's, it's her job to get all of this stuff rehomed. She runs our lumber yard here that I'm sitting at and, uh, she does a great job, but she could probably give you a billion lessons learned. So we, we've been plugging away at building that market. <clears throat> we've been expanding our market to include Jacksonville, Charleston, and Atlanta. We've just launched a partnership relatively recent, recently with a life cycle building in Atlanta. They not only consign our materials through their warehouse, since they don't do structural removal, they only do interior non-structural. 
They don't have a ready supply of lumber and we have too much lumber. So we, sh we truck it up to Atlanta um, and they sell it on consignment. They were also our hosts for the training this and wow. that we did in Atlanta. So wow. I would say best practices are create a network, <laughs> yep. uh, develop your network. Do not rely on everybody to come to you. Of course, this is sales. You got to go out. You got to do your, your outreach. Um, but I would also say take tips. I, I take tips from many different industries. I, we don't have a whole lot. I and mean, we have our wonderful mentors, the people who've been doing reuse retail for a long time, angels and saints, all of them, who we can look to for guidance, but, but it's not enough. So we try to pull inspiration from many different fields. And I mentioned this just specifically because uh, we look at wine, how wine is sold, because I like that word provenance. Provenance is one of the most important value assessing tools for wine. We're trying to center it here as well in the reuse market. Where this stuff comes from matters. The histories that are attached to it matters. So we build an enormous amount of community buy-in by inviting people into the narrative of our deconstructions, not only watching us through social media as we're literally taking the building apart right there in their community, but also sharing that history, the research that it just creates much more connection. And you'd be amazed how much that drives interest in, in acquiring materials and becoming a part of this narrative and sharing in this like warm, fuzzy glow. Uh, it, it, it brings people to us, people at all socioeconomic levels, folks who just wanna scrap so that they can snuggle it, but also folks who wanna put flooring in their brand new build that's 3000 square feet. I mean, you know, like big sales, big customers as well. Right. Everybody's got a heart. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for that. Um, actually, we, we, we own significant elements here at Historic Ithaca, and we've been doing salvage for 30 years. And that's, curation is a big piece of it, I think, May, and you're right. Yes. Like the, the curation and the connection um, sells a lot of things, but it also, um, it's, it's, it's the warm and fuzzy, but then there's the practical side of it too. Yes. So that is a, a great, a great, great uh, statement. <laughs> Um, we have another question uh, coming from Maddie Carter. Is there an age of a building that you prefer not to deconstruct? Uh, in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, Canada area, they have deconstruction bylaws for buildings older than 1950, any newer, and I assume it's an issue with asbestos and other not as valuable materials. Is this similar in the Savannah area? Yes, although I like to say that can be asbestos in any age building because they're often updated. So um, while it's yeah, I mean, we have we we have every building we work on tested and abated. So the asbestos thing is is pretty universal regardless of age. But yes, the material value is significantly lower in newer buildings. I I want them as old as I can get them. The older the the nicer the materials. <laughs> but I will deconstruct any building. And if it comes down to the fact that I'm not going to have enough material value to justify the labor and harvesting the materials, then I need to get creative. All that means is I need to get creative. So we work with Habitat for Humanity on our new building materials. We have new building materials that are coming in, even in our historic buildings, there's an addition or there's some repair or there's a porch or there's a shed. You know, we, we still have a, a relatively decent volume of new materials that we're handling that comes through. So we work with volunteers that are being sourced to us from Habitat for Humanity that helps control our labor costs and investment. And then we just literally, they bring it, they send us the truck, we load the materials up, we send it to them for free. It doesn't cost me any storage. I don't have to keep it on site. And then they can retail it to the community at super low prices, which also helps satisfy our mission of making building materials, re reclaim building materials more accessible. But I will say it is so true that modern buildings are not the same as historic buildings. And it is always because of the materials which are not reclaimable and i'm going to talk about my big three hated hated things construction grade adhesive portland cement and spray foam <laughs> these things make it really hard for us to do our job they make it unpleasant for us to do our job we'll do it uh but i like to I like to use these as opportunities to think outside the box. We're not going to get it and be as precious with a building like this as we are with a historic building. We are probably going to try to look for opportunities to panelize that building and keep walls as walls because they have more value as walls than as two by fours. Those two by fours aren't worth hardly anything. So I hope that answers the question. Yes, any building can be deconstructed. And I also like to point out um, mass timber, of course, is a growing trend in, in building. And yes. everybody likes to you know, celebrate how mass timber is so, so such a great opportunity for sustainability because it can use the waste from the lumber industry. 
it can also use the waste from deconstruction of new buildings at scale. So I think that it's going to look mechanized, but it's going to look different than it looks now. When it comes to harvesting new buildings at a large scale in the future, I do think that they will be recycled for reuse. I do think that all that new lumber will be converted into LVLs and, and put into skyscrapers. It's it, And it, I do think it will still be relatively mechanical, uh, but it still won't be crushed and dumped in the landfill like it is right now. Right, right. absolutely. Great. That's a great answer. Um, someone else said, great presentation. How is your organization funded and hmm. do you compete when bidding a job with traditional demo crews? I love when people ask me this question because I love to <laughs> brag on this. Uh, we are very, we, we are very fortunate to be, I say this, somebody might disagree. I say we are fortunate to be mostly self-supported. We are almost entirely funded by our own earned income. We, I know it's unusual for the, for a nonprofit. Um, and I, I do think that that is uh, something that I'm proud of because I like to say, if we can do it, you can do it. And you don't need to have a big grant. We don't, we've never won a big grant. Biggest grant we ever won was our seed money when we first got started five years ago and that was $30,000. I mean, it was small. Um, by comparison, uh, for some, that's a pretty large grant, but it goes quick. Um, this is slow, hard, and expensive work, and we are competing with fast, cheap, and easy work. Yes, we do compete with demolition. And I got to say, I don't want to leave it out of the equation. Our board does a great job fundraising. They really put their heart and soul into it. And the fundraising has absolutely contributed to our bottom line. We would be in the red without it. Um, I'm proud to say that we are in the black. Um, but the vast majority, more than three quarters of our income is earned. So yes, we are competing with demolition. Uh, and we do sometimes have to really take a loss in the field. But we are, we're, we're getting pretty good at this. So if we have to take a loss in the field, which is rare, most of our jobs at this point, we're still able to turn a profit in the field and then still turn a profit at the lumber yard um, in processing and then retail. But if we do have to take a loss in the field just because we can't let this building flip between the cracks, uh, we just try to make up for it in other places. We try to do extra fundraising around that project, especially if we're working for a low income client who just needs help and support we're going to make it happen. Um, and the great thing about competing with demolition, again, is it makes it my, my argument really ironclad. If I can compete with demolition in Georgia, you can do it too anywhere. Uh, <laughs> land, landfilling in Georgia is super cheap. It's very affordable. Um, it blew my mind looking at the estimate for demolition for this project up, up in uh, upstate New York and Schenectady because the demolition cost, I was looking at the breakdown of the estimated demolition cost and the cost just to landfill exceeded what the total demand that we would have been able to make for the entire demolition or deconstruction here in Georgia. Just the cost of landfilling would have been more than the entire project budget. So that alone could really shift the economics of this and help advantage deconstruction over demolition just in the marketplace. Um, I don't have a lot of faith that that's going to change here in Georgia tomorrow. It is part of what we work on when we look at policy uh, and how to advocate for a more sustainable future is getting that cost of landfilling to match what it does up the coast, but, but yes, we do, we do compete and we are competitive. That's awesome. Congratulations. That's amazing. That's Thanks. awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Just awesome. Um, someone wanted to know where can we find more information on uh, the deconstruction workshop in July? That would be for probably Hannah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, if you stay tuned to schenectadyhistorical.org and I can put that in the chat, we will be making an official announcement in the next couple of weeks and people will be able to sign up and get more information. And just to add to the last point that May made, um, for the skeptics on the board who you know, looked at me like I had three heads when I started talking about deconstruction, when I showed them the numbers that it would actually cost less than demolition, that really swayed a lot of people. So um, yeah. Definitely a good thing to know. It really matters where you're at, you know. I mean, it, it was a benefit to me to be able to bring our Georgia numbers to y'all to help provide a solution to this. Um, but you know, I'm jealous. I'm jealous of how how at a how do I say this? If I was trying to run the same business in upstate New York, I would win every job because we have gotten super good at keeping our economics super tight because we're working in a super competitive, very antithetical, non-supportive ecosystem. And that's made us sort of really tough. Um, so in an ecosystem where demolition doesn't have it quite so easy, like in New York state, you know, wow, what a benefit. 
uh, what an opportunity. And I, 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 I'm like, maybe we should just pack up and move up to New York because I would, I would still like to, <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay, we, we might be coming. I would yeah. like to <laughs> pay my staff more. I mean, we all make a, like a livable wage, which becomes even harder when we talk about inflation. We're doing our best to keep up with the rising cost of living, but it's a struggle here. We don't, I don't, I don't make as much as I should. All of us could do better. We, we, we do better year over year. We assess for raises every six months and we always get them. Uh, and so we are growing and growing that bubble of profit that's allowing us to reinvest in our staff but it is hard here it's tough here and i'm i i am jealous of places that have better policy that's more environmentally based and looking out for 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 alternative solutions for sustainable solutions for the marketplace well that's that's a compliment to new york state thank you yes <laughs> thank you <laughs> wasn't sure i'd hear that ever <laughs> um for where we sit um yeah. So uh, thanks, May. someone said, uh, Maddie Carter said, thanks, May, great answer about the, the spray foam. I understand the spray foam hatred. So um, <laughs> um, I had another question for you, actually. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat. If anybody had one, please uh, put them in there. Um, with the trades, the trades um, people that we see, at least where we sit, are really aging out. They are mostly mm -hmm. a male workforce. Um, have you figured out where, how women can be in those spaces as well, um, I guess, to construct or repair or do historic preservation? Have you yes. had any success with that? Oh, yes. Well, obviously, because of our mission and because we are so preservation aligned and because we are in such a preservation community, which is also a small town, <laughs> We interact a lot with the major stakeholders in, in preservation. And, and the major stakeholders in preservation in Savannah, Georgia are nationally recognized as major. Savannah is a big deal. We're very proud to be here contributing to that. And as such, our trainees get an enormous amount of crossover. They get to interact with and learn from a lot of preservation trades women and trades men. Um, and we are proud to say here in our warehouse, we've, we've got a little bit of a small business incubator. We had a lot of space. And so we decided to sublet some of it out to preservation, the people who do the opposite of what we do, who, who put it back together, which is a really happy uh, marriage often. Say for example, here in my warehouse, we have our, our doors for retail uh, and we have Natalie Henshaw, women-owned Henshaw Preservation, women-owned uh, preservation company that specializes in the restoration of doors and windows. So our customers can come here, pick out a door, they want it restored. It goes right over to Natalie's shop. Natalie restores it for them. And then it goes into the new home or the historic home. Um, and we get the chance to do crossover training. So we recently just hosted our very first um, window restoration workshop here at the lumber yard. We're about to do another one uh, and our crew gets to benefit from that. Great. And also just the interacting with that, with that preservation community creates opportunities for employment. There has been a lot of uh, trading, you know, a lot of women who were in the preservation and restoration field have come over to work for us. And then some of our graduates have gone to work in the preservation and restoration field. Great. That's great. Um, I just, I have a couple comments for you. I don't know if you'll see them ultimately, but I'll read them back to you. Uh, Kevin Hayes said he's of reuse action in Buffalo. Uh, reclaimed building materials since 2006. We've deconstructed more than 200 buildings using wow. big banks, hybrid, I know, right? Uh, deconstruction methods. Um, I've been intrigued by your work in Savannah since you started. And that's, he wrote that right as you started. So hey, Kevin, let you know her before. Uh, Lynn Leopold from here. Um, I am a great supporter of deconstruction and I'm doubly pleased to see the program about women doing this work. Very exciting. She was involved. On, I've met Lynn um, with Finger Lakes Reuse for many years as a board member and supporter. Um, so let me just come back down. Uh, Kathy Misra said, I love the stories and photos on your website about the buildings you deconstruct. Extraordinary. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I think I've got everybody. Um, anybody have any other um, questions for uh, our panelists. Oh, oh, and then wait, this is a um, from uh, biz at frontporchimprovement.com. I am in Savannah and hoping to learn more and become involved. So Hello. looks like you have another person. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for zooming in. Yeah. Uh, hang on. Um, and Julie Fuchs said, thank you very much. So um, anything else anyone would like to add? Are you uh, panelists, do you have any further thoughts, comments? 
I will. I know we just have five minutes left, but I wanted to reflect. I, I took the slide out because I was worried about time and now I wish I kept it. I feel like this group will appreciate this anecdote. When I was doing research on, on uh, sort of the job market, you know, um, I found that I, I like to point out that deconstruction takes six times the workforce that, dem that demolition takes, right? But then a common question from people in construction and demolition is, yeah, but what good is six times more jobs if there's a labor crisis? And I always laugh at this question because I say there's not a labor crisis, there's an access crisis, right? When you keep trying to hire from the same labor pool and it's not working, you want to call it a crisis, but expand your horizons. And there's a very eager workforce that wants safe, inclusive training. You have to make safe, inclusive training in order for that to work. But I always like to laugh because when I'm doing research on the, the labor crisis, uh, you see the funniest headlines. Uh, I saw one the other day that says, employer forced to pay his employees $25 an hour and offer benefits due to labor crisis. I was like, oh man, poor guy. Um, and the, the best one I saw was employers are considering looking to robotics because of the labor crisis. I'm like, oh, you know, young straight white men don't wanna take these jobs, must, must go to robots now. Like no other option. Obviously there's half of the world <laughs> available still. And, and more than half, honestly, uh, if we're looking at marginalized, even, even people of color, men who are excluded in some, in some ecosystems from these careers. I, I just wanted to say, I, I, find it, I find it fascinating to talk about access and inclusivity in the construction industry with the people who are the most concerned with how it's shrinking uh, because they just need, I think, a little bit of blinders taken off to realize it's not that there aren't enough people to do the work, it's that you're asking the wrong people to do the work. And if you're going to broaden those horizons, you have to do it thoughtfully. You do have to do the work of making sure that spaces are safe. I don't recommend that you just start throwing a bunch of women into a super hostile working environment. Um, take the time to do cross training, take the time to do diversity, equity and inclusion training, make sure you're doing it right and just open those doors up and let the ladies come to work. Great. Thank you, May. Thank you so much for everything that you're doing. Um, one more question before we end, and this will this will be the the the, uh, the end one. Um, you're doing such great work. This is from Greener Mind Community. How can we arrange a visit, be part of a deconstruction crew? So you are also doing some um, recruiting right now. Great. Well, you can, <laughs> you can reach out to me. We're at repurposesavanna.org. We're very easy to Google. Um, you can contact us through any number of clicks, buttons, and email addresses on our website, social media. Um, I'm happy to have you here. I'm also happy to come to you. Uh, just let me know what you need. Just ask Hannah. We'll, 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 we'll move heaven and earth to get to where you are and help you get a building down. We got yes. upstate New yeah. York and Savannah so far in Atlanta. So yes. <laughs> yes. <That's there. laughs> and uh, last note, thank you so much, May. Thanks to Crowd for hosting. Uh, thank you all for showing up today. This was a great conversation. Of course, we could go on for another couple of hours. Yeah. Um, sounds like a conference to me, y'all. Um, oh, anyway, great. a couple of them, yeah. So yeah. we um, we'll see you all soon. And uh, don't forget, on May first, we have another um, another crowd conversation uh, with the Cornell students, and they've done some wonderful work. I have seen it, and thank you all. And uh, make sure you tune into our uh, website and his website and Hannah's website, and um, we will see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Thanks, May. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Thanks, Gretchen. Gretchen.